This is Google on Google, uh, or as I added on to this, running Google on Google. Uh, the focus of the session is going to be talking about how we in corporate engineering uh, have kept pace with the growth of Google uh, you know, over the last 14 years or so. Uh, my name is Jeff Bates. I'm the open source IT program manager uh, within corporate engineering. And with me, as you can see on the slide as well, is Houston Pop, who is a systems engineer and the tech lead on Gennetti, which is one of the uh, products that we built within corporate engineering as well. Um, <clears throat> So what is corporate engineering? Uh, I suspect many of you in this room have been in uh, IT before. And uh, corporate engineering is uh, what we call IT within Google. Uh, we do a lot of different things inside of Google. And I think as you know, probably a lot of you can attest to, uh, IT ends up doing a lot of different things within a lot of uh, different companies as well. Uh, in our case, what we, what, what we really set out to do is empower Googlers with world-leading technologies. So that can span a wide gamut of things from building systems uh, to giving them tools to work with. So to give you a sense of, uh, you know, uh, of, of what it is we do, we are the IT. And what that means is that we're supporting offices in every continent in the world except for Antarctica which turns out doesn't have a very large population, so we haven't added any offices there yet. Uh, it means we work with everyone. And yes, we, I, we speak very quietly as I tear the microphone from me. All right, I think that works now. Okay, uh, that's a wardrobe malfunction, perhaps. Uh, so we support everything from the uh, real estate services who make the actual uh, offices run and getting people in there and the security systems that are associated with that as well. Uh, we make sure that everyone is actually paid on time because it turns out people like to do things like uh, you know, buy food and clothing and go out and do things like that. Uh, and they also like to be paid you know, legally and regularly as well. Uh, you know, as part of that, we also do uh, the compliance systems that comes with that, because having all of these offices in all of these different countries means that there are a lot of uh, countries like to do things differently, it turns out, and we need to be able to work within each of those environments. Uh, part of what we do as well is uh, running the help desk within Google, and that's, again, within all of the offices that we've got. Um, we do something, as I'll talk about later in the presentation, we take a very, uh, I think, innovative and unique approach to doing that. We call them tech stops, and we, uh, uh, well, I'll talk in more detail about that later. Uh, also, given that it's Google, we have the all-important task of making sure that the massage scheduling takes place on time, because that, that is obviously very critical. Um, but, you know, in addition, uh, for those of you who are based here in the Bay Area, you may have seen some of the uh, buses that go back and forth from Mountain View into the surrounding areas. Uh, I, you know, out here in the Bay Area, we end up running you know, something that is close to the uh, largest private bus fleet in the state of California. And this kind of gets back to the idea of being able to empower Googlers. Um, you know, rather than having people sit in the parking lot that is referred to as Highway 101, we want to keep them productive. We want to keep them efficient. We want to keep them happy. And so when you're riding on the bus to and from work, that we keep, the, you know, we keep Wi-Fi available so that people aren't using that time when they're sitting in 101 having their blood pressure slowly get higher, but instead are able to work and are able to get things done as well. So you know, part, of how, you know, part of how we go about building these systems is like any company or any organization, we have this, you know, this choice between buying systems and building systems. And we do both within CorpEng. You know, sometimes we're you know, buying something because it's going to be the best tool that's available. Sometimes we're going to build something because we want to solve a unique problem, or we want to solve a problem better than we think it has been solved elsewhere before. Uh, but one of the things we consistently try to do with that is sharing the lessons that we've learned, sometimes painfully, sometimes not quite so painfully, so that people don't have to go out and have the same problem, you know, and solve the same problems that we have already gone through. That's, you know, that, that, that takes a number of different forms. Uh, at the end of the presentation, and when this is posted later, we'll have a, uh, I have a number of links to some of the other materials that we've done before, presentations that we've given, uh, and other you know, usage of Hangouts on the air to talk to people. Uh, in the various offices around the world as well, we uh, host user groups that come in from you know, Linux user groups to the Mac admin groups to you know, uh, programming and other interdisciplinary groups as well. Uh, and that, that includes people both within work, who work within Google and people who work elsewhere. Because it's, 
It's only by actually working and sharing the information together that you know, things actually move forward. And rather than seeing people smash their head in the same wall that we've had to, uh, it just, a, a rising tide floats all boats. Uh, the last is conference speaking, which I think is probably self-evident what that is. Uh, I assume if you're here, you recognize that. Uh, and you know, within the links at the back, we've also got the office hours that we host, the IRC, the mailing list that we do as well. Um, you know, as I said, we, you know, we absolutely do buy software and bring it in and work with that. Uh, we also build software. Uh, and that is often, you know, that's, as I alluded to, that's when we're trying to solve a unique problem or we're not happy with the solutions that are out there. And what we try to do in that case is uh, often we will make that available under various open source licenses. And you know, when I talk about building the software, I'm talking about everything from you know, one of the projects that we have open sourced is a compliance framework. And that is you know, for doing legal compliance and being able to file the reports is building a framework. Now this is not, that, that is a generic problem. That is something that people can reuse that. So what we built internally, we then made available to the rest of the world. Uh, some of the other things that, that we have released recently, one is the uh, dowdy little fellow there. He is, in fact, a cauliflower, uh, and he's wearing a vest, which is appropriate given that it's called cauliflower vest. Uh, that is, in fact, an uh, anagram for file vault key escrow. Uh, and part of what we, uh, uh, the reason for that is using the full disk encryption that uh, Apple shipped in the most recent versions of uh, OS X, is we wanted a way to be able to manage that at scale. And there was not tools that, that we thought were appropriate uh, at hand to do that. So we set about building Cauliflower Vest and then released that to the, uh, to the rest of the world. Uh, similarly, you know, we have one of the, we have a very, very large Mac fleet internally. And managing that, managing the licensing, managing the installation of the software was a problem that, yeah, there, there are solutions that are out there, but you know, we, we figured out a way that we wanted to do it uh, and built something called Simeon, which is what we use uh, uh, internally for managing the software in the Mac fleet and have also made available under an open source license. Um, but this is not just a scenario in which we try to you know, build one-off solutions because we want to build, you know, we want to build something unique. Uh, just as important in that is contributing back to the other corpus of works. So uh, part of what Simeon is built on is something called Monkey. Uh, which is another uh, open source tool that was originally developed uh, by folks at Walt Disney Studios. And so it is you know, it's something where we will build something in, you know, where we will build something internally, but where we can and where it is appropriate, we will go through and actually use what else is out there and contribute back to the greater body of knowledge. Um, so, you know, obviously in this case, I work within Google's IT, but I think the lessons that we're talking about here are something that can be applied within your own organization, you know, regardless of your size. And this isn't something that can, you know, needs to be strictly applied to, uh, you know, to, to working with other internal customers. This is something where you know, the lessons we've learned can also be applied to people who are working. Uh, you know, if, if, you're, if your business is growing and you're having to figure out how you are going to you know, have a more efficient process, uh, how to automate more, and how to be able to do that uh, so that you can scale with the growth of your business. I think these lessons ring true as well. Um, so to set a sense of scale of, uh, of, of what we've had to contend with, um, math, uh, I, I think it's probably fair to say 284 and 30,467 uh, are pretty different numbers. Um, and for those of you who take a particular excitement in reading SEC filings, you can find in that the uh, most recent filing uh, at the end of Q1 of this year that uh, Google is just over 30, 33,000 full-time employees at this point. Um, as, as I've said before, this is also uh, literally in every other continent but Antarctica. So this is a challenge both in terms of the number of people who are involved and the sheer you know, growth on that side but also the number of environments that, that we're working in as well, the number of countries, the sheer number of different offices. And I think it's probably also worth pointing out that you know, the company that was there in 2001 and 2011, we do a lot of different stuff. You know, the, uh, I'm sure many of you saw the, uh, you know, the keynote yesterday talking about uh, the release of Jelly Bean. You know, the Jelly Bean wasn't a glimmer, and well, maybe it was a glimmer in Andy's eye in 2001, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. But, 
the growth in what the company has done has been, uh, has, has been a very meteoric rise, and we've had to keep pace with that as well. And these are some of the ways that we've gone about doing that. So let's you know, take a practical use case. Uh, I've, I've long held this private, well, it's, uh, semi-private theory that tickets ultimately function as like a, a neural network for a company or an organization. I'm sure almost everyone in this room has worked significantly with tickets in the past, whether it be bug trackers, whether it be filing tickets for HR benefits, for getting, you know, getting an office set up, for dealing with a cable company, for anything else like that. And you know, within Google, this is something that we use a lot. You know? And by a lot, I mean you know, last year alone, the support organization had over half a million tickets. When I talk about the support organization, I'm talking about the IT support side. You know, the total number of tickets that we were dealing with was uh, a little bit over two million tickets in the course of one year. A lot of that is machine-generated tickets talking to another machine. But it was something that, you know, that level of growth, uh, it takes a lot of people to go, you know, to go and deal with those tickets. And um, we had to figure out, especially uh, a few years ago, how we were going to continue to grow with that because the number of tickets kept going up, the number of different ways that they were used kept going up, and we had to figure out a way that this would continue to be an efficient way for people to be able to get things done and how we were going to go about building that tool. So enter the angry clothes washer. Um, <clears throat> this is actually uh, the, the logo for one of the tools that, that we have built internally that's called Stuffomatic. And Stuffomatic is kind of uh, Let's say uh, the, the epitome of the, the approach that we've taken to uh, working with tickets and reproducing processes. So uh, one of the other systems that, that we use as well is uh, called GTR. And that you know, is Google Ticket Routing. As you can see, we've, uh, you know, naming is something that uh, uh, took a lot of time on that one. Uh, you know, so up until uh, a few years ago, the way that we dealt with the tickets is we had people and they would go through and they would categorize the tickets and they would go and categorize more tickets and then they categorize more tickets and they would go through and people would work off of them and send updates from there. But you know, as we got to this time frame and the company was continuing its growth rate, it became really, really clear that this was just not going to be a way that we were gonna be able to grow. Um, that you know, eventually you reach the point where you can only have only so many humans doing things and you need to get computers involved in making that happen. And so at that point we said, well, okay, what is this problem like? Uh, well, it turns out dealing with that many tickets is kind of like dealing with spam. And I certainly would not want to impugn that any of my colleagues are spam farmers or anything like that, but given the sheer amount of tickets they're generating, there's a great degree of likeness inside of there. So what we did is we said, hmm, all right, what, what are the things inside of here that we can recognize the patterns from and be able to build an automated response to this? And not necessarily a response that was going to resolve the ticket, although we did start to do that later, but even at that point, just making sure the tickets ended up in the right place. And so we, put, you know, we, began, to be, we began to put the system into place, and that was a very, very key for us. Um, you know, by running the math, the ability to use the ticket routing system, which has uh, you know, pretty close to a 99.7 success rate for being able to get the tickets into the right queues, uh, you know, in 2010, that saved us roughly 28,000 man hours of time. Uh, in 2011, it saved us 41,000 man hours in time. And that, that's a lot of time. And when you save that much time and you save that much money, you begin to put energy into doing other things. You begin to, you know, maybe it means hiring more people. Maybe it means being able to look at other problems that you can reduce down to a reproducible problem and find a fix for and address that particular set of issues. You know, the other flip side is, is that it meant the problems got resolved more quickly. It meant that queues, you know, the getting information into the right category and the right queue happened much more quickly at that point. And that meant that you had a much happier and more productive staff working on issues as well. And it's, you know, it's, it, this is not like we're, you know, uh, sending a rocket to Mars or anything like that. 
What it is is thinking thoughtfully about the data that you have and what is going to save the time and what is going to save energy and what is going to keep your team working as efficiently and happily as possible, you know, both in terms of the customers that you have and also the teams that actually need to work with these systems as well. So, you know, one of the other things that we do, as I alluded to at the beginning, is we're in charge of running all of the uh, help desks inside of Google. Um, but we take, we take you know, at least in the companies I've worked in in the past, um, sometimes the help desk is literally someone's desk that is in a corner, and, you know, sometimes that, that is how it needs to be. Uh, what we have done at Google is we've, we've tried to turn these into uh, centers. We call them tech stops. And one of the most key things that we have found inside of there is the philosophy of solving the problem at first contact. So when someone comes in and they walk into a tech stop and they're having a problem with their machine, is how quickly can you solve that problem? Or if they don't want to walk into a tech stop or they're working from home, you provide the services to them in the way that is going to be most convenient for them. Uh, whether that be uh, you know, via video chat, or whether that be via text chat, or whether that be you know, uh, self-service through being able to find the information online, is you want to get them the information as efficiently and quickly as possible. Uh, and part of that is also choosing who you're going to bring, uh, uh, choosing who you hire into that organization. What we look for when we want to hire people into there is people who, you know, at at a small company, that might be the IT guy or the sysadmin that is inside of there. Um, you know, the, there's a, uh, my friend uh, Rob Maldo, uh, he and I started a site called Slashdot together. And he was often asked to describe the demographic of the site. And believe me, there is no way to describe the demographic. But he had a, he had a choice phrase for it, which I think is an apt description for the people we asked to, you know, the people who we want working in the tech stops. It's people who have the love of technology in their blood. It's people who are passionate about technology. They're genderless, they are intellectually curious, and they want to learn more. And so you, you, know, you bring these people inside of the organization. And you know, in some cases, uh, we use this model that's been around for about 2,000 years or so called an apprenticeship, where you bring in people who are curious and want to learn more, and you have them paired with people who have been doing this for a while, and they learn from them. And it turns out everyone is far happier and more productive in that process. And so, uh, you know, I, I know that this sounds all well and good that, well, you're Google, of course you've been able to do this, you know, you, you, know, you just hire all the people to put it in there. Um, what, we have, what, what we have found by running all the numbers is that actually our cost to provide support uh, within the company is, is well below what the industry average for support is. Because rather than you know, focusing on how much you can squeeze out of it, you want to get people to be as productive and efficient and quickly as possible, uh, you know, back to work as quickly as possible. Because while it might be, you know, in one sense, be like, well, let's, you know, let's, they, they have to do this this way, they have to do this this way. No, what you really want to do is you want to have someone come in, get their problem solved, and be back to writing code as quickly as possible. Because them writing code matters far more than whether, uh, you know, whether, it's just a lot more pleasant for everyone who's involved in that. You know, part of how we've gone about doing that is, is really a, a, a two-fold side of choice and transparency. You want to give people the choice so that they're using the tools that are the most effective for them. So when you come to work at Google, um, you know, Houston has a, uh, is, is running, well, the laptop's closed, but he's running Linux over there. I'm running this off of a MacBook. You come in, you've got a choice between them, and it's not like we're running a, you know, a commune where you can run whatever you want to or something like that. You need to have everything within the bounds of keeping the data and information secure and safe and easily available. But, you know, you're, you're trying to hire the smartest people that you possibly can, regardless of the company that you're in. So trying to constrain their choice and make them use something that they're going to be less effective in would seem to me, at least, to be you know, pretty counterproductive at that point. Uh, so we give them a choice. Uh, part of it as well as also, especially over the last several years, has been changing how you deliver the services. Now, ultimately, the mindset of you know, making people operate within the constraints of how you want them to and is most convenient for you is, you know, that's, that's, that's riding the fail boat at that point. So what that has meant is delivering far more of the services through a you know, mobile platform 
or delivering it in a way that they can access it at home, something like that. Um, it's kind of hard to see here on the, uh, on, on the slide here, but on the right side is a wireframe rack. And this is something that is a common feature throughout the tech stops and uh, throughout the organization. And what that is is that you can walk into the tech stop and we have, you know, let's see, on there is Ethernet cable, it's power adapters, it's headphones, it's uh, cable organizers, it's, it is all the various miscellaneous items that you need to get your work done. And what we do is you walk in, you swipe your badge, you use a little scan gun, and you check the stuff out and you walk away. But, you know, all right, so that's great. That saves a lot of time. Rather than making someone file a PO so that they can order a new mouse, you know, a mouse costs like, uh, you know, almost nothing at this point, and you've just wasted a lot of time making people go, you know, jump through that hoop. So we make it easy for them to come up and get it. But part of that, and back to hiring smart people, is also treating them like adults. So when they come in, there's the price for everything that is listed on there. And we're not gonna, you know, we, we obviously don't charge them for that, but we keep track of all of that. And so what that means is that when people come in and they, you know, they get one of these items, they can see all of the other stuff that they've gotten over time. And the interesting side effect of that is it turns out when you treat people like adults, they actually reciprocate. And so what happens is that when people are using some of these items and they don't need it anymore, they will come back and they'll check it back in and put it away. So you get this kind of constant cycle of people using items. And you know, it goes back to treat people the way that, that, you, that, that you would like them to be treated and, or you would like to be treated. So um, one of the other things that have been key for our ability to grow is uh, it has been using our own tools. Um, my Gmail that I use every day while I'm at work is the Gmail that you, know, you well, hopefully are, are using to check your email as well. You know, we build a lot of these tools we have built for ourselves internally to solve problems. And because we're solving generic problems is then sharing it out with the world. You know, the calendar, calendar really came about because we weren't happy with the calendar tools that we have within Google. We said, all right, well, we can, we, we, we can do a better job for this. Because you know, scheduling meetings across time zones and everything was not a particularly pleasant process. And so when we built this, we then said, well, all right, we've kind of, we're pretty happy with this. How about we make this available to everyone else? And this continues to grow out over time. I mean, it's now been, I think, a year and a day since uh, Google Plus uh, was officially rolled out. And, you know, Part of, the, part of the success of Google Plus has been the inclusion of the Hangouts. And part of where Hangouts came from was Google is you know, something like the world's largest private used, civilian user of video conferencing. You know, again, we've got all these offices and everything else like that. Um, it makes a huge difference. When you can actually see someone on the other end and you can communicate with them and you can see the body language and you can see what they're saying, that is a far more efficient way for doing things. And we took that, you know, that, the knowledge that we had learned from that and said, well, this is something that we should make available to the rest of the world. Yeah, Gmail, you know, Gmail was letting you do a chat, you know, do video chat and things like that. But what Hangouts has meant is that it became a much broader affair. So you could have people in different locations. And this kind of goes back to the idea of when we have, you know, the, these problems that we try to solve for ourselves, we also want to make available to the rest of the world too. So, foresight. I, I suppose another word for foresight would be proactive, but I really, really can't stand the word uh, proactive, uh, although it's a fairly apt, uh, apt description. Um, now, the ability to see what is coming down the road, and the way that you can see what is coming up is by, you know, people talk about big data. I, I'd actually like all data. I mean, on a, on a practical basis, you should keep all of the logs and all of the data that you possibly can. Because it's only by looking at that data and it's only by looking at that information that you're gonna be able to figure out the problem that you need to solve for you know, 18 months from now or two, or two years from now. Because as your business grows or as your organization grows or as whatever you're doing grows, what is a minor irritant to you right now is going to become a giant flaming problem for you 18 months from now. I mean, at least hopefully. As, as odd as that sentence may sound. And it's, it's by looking at that stuff and by having that available that you'll know what problems it is that you need to address at that point. 
So I, I, I know that that's probably gravitationally impossible. I mean, unless the rock on the right is a particularly porous form of rock. But what that comes down to is how do you keep this balance inside of there, and how are you able to continue to grow? Uh, if I could say, if uh, one of the best things that I've learned uh, over time is do not be beholden to the past. Um, so that has taken a number of different forms within uh, uh, corporate engineering. Uh, one of them is, is that a uh, little bit, uh, about two and a half years ago now, we began uh, moving more and more of our apps into uh, Google's cloud platform. And I I'm, I'm not going to say that it was, you know, uh, you know, unicorns and fairy dust to start that from the beginning. It requires a whole different way of doing things. But once we started doing that, and the benefits that we got from that is, you know, so within the support organization, for instance, it takes us 25% uh, less time to deliver new apps. You know, simply because of the ease of being able to deploy on the cloud platform and to build something new and to have it rolled out and delivered. And one of the other benefits that has come from that is, is that we haven't had to, you know, we, we haven't had to get any new pagers for people in the last couple of years. Because we've been able to take that problem of providing operational support and, well, make it someone else's problem at that point, actually. That, but what that means is, you know, you, you don't have people having to get up in the middle of the night and try to solve a problem because you can rely on the platform as a service to actually deal with that. And when you don't have to do that, then you can go back and you can start to look at your data. You can start to figure out what you need to do to move things forward. Um, now, I, the other point that I would make as well with that is that thinking about how you operate and changing that. So an example is with, within support, in the last couple of years, the number of people that the support organization actually supports has grown by 68%. That's a lot of people. Uh, the support organization has grown by 4%. Four and 68 are not close to each other in, well, I guess it depends on your sense of scale, but they're pretty far off from each other at that point. So how were we able to do that? We were able to do that because we went through and we said, okay, what's the information people really want? Um, you know, and what is the best way to deliver that? So making better tools available, making it so that people can actually, again, this is kind of like proactive in that I hate the word, but it's accurate, uh, crowdsourcing where people who are, you know, have solved a particular edge case problem are able to share that with each other. And that has led to a far greater efficiency and productivity with that. But by the same notion of also you know, not being beholden to the past, you need to realize that sometimes the problems you solve are ones that you know, aren't going to be answered by necessarily going into the cloud or changing your traditional IT stack. Um, and we still do run many apps like that. Uh, and Houston, who will be talking next, is uh, in charge of Gennetti, which is one of the ways that uh, we go about supporting that. Thanks, Jeff. Mm -hmm. So, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Justin Pop, and uh, I work in uh, the Google Switzerland office. And for most of my um, lifetime in Google, I've been working on Gennetti. What is Gennetti? If you go to the project homepage, you will see there are some very nice words, open source uh, cluster-based virtualization manager. And um, what it actually means is that about um, six years ago, we said uh, we want to start using virtualization in our IT fleet and uh, per the process that Jeff described. We went to look at what uh, projects were there. And of course, there was already VMware, there was some open source stuff and so on, but um, none of the tools at that time offered what we wanted a way to scale from very small deployments to large deployments, uh, while at the same time not depending on external infrastructure like shared storage or uh, very expensive networking gear and so on. So we said, um, let's go build something simple. We'll run it for a couple of years on a small scale, and that will be it. Um, however, it didn't turn out uh, that simple in the end, and now we are still running Anetti, and we manage with it uh, almost all the internal uh, virtualized fleet. Um, we run it both in the offices that Jeff mentioned uh, across the whole world, uh, where we run Ganeti, for example, in very small um, deployments, like two free physical machines managed by Ganeti, which provide around 15 or 20 virtual machines. And we also run it at the other end of the scale in data centers where we have um, various workloads like 
I don't know, um, engineers that want to run a LAMP stack that cannot, uh, the application cannot be moved to the cloud yet or so on, or virtual workstations, which we use a lot and so on. So the scale that uh, Ganeti covers from um, one, two physical machines to, to one, uh, one or 200 physical machines spanning two order of, ma of magnitude means that there's a lot of um, uh, balance needed to, to make sure that Ganeti works well, both for the lower end of the scale and for the high end. So for example, challenges here are, uh, we don't want someone who tries Ganeti at first, for example, uh, runs Debian or Ubuntu and just runs apt-get install Ganeti and configures the cluster. We don't want this person to, to be burdened by a very complex uh, setup procedure and requiring a, a very complex uh, co uh, software environment. At the other end of the scale, we don't want that um, scaling Ganeti up uh, is hampered by the fact that it also supports very small environments. Um, so there's, um, as, as Jeff uh, mentioned, the scale of scaling or the, the problems in, in scaling up are also appearing not only in the organization but also in the kind of software development products that we do in, in corporate IT. And um, to help solve this, uh, what we did in Ganeti is um, simply make sure that uh, the way we architect Ganeti uh, is to allow for incremental improvements and scalability and not requiring you when you move, for example, from 10 physical machines to 100 physical machines to change the way you deploy Ganeti or the actual uh, features that Ganeti offer you. And today I think we, are, we were pretty successful with that. You can start with installing Ganeti on, on a single laptop and then uh, keep adding physical machines to this um, environment and scale it up to 100 machines and, and it works well. Um, we still have some, of course, some, some corner issues, some uh, cases where scalability is not that good, but, but overall it works for us and we use it, as I said, extensively. Another problem that we have with, um, with Ganeti is that, as I said, it's an open source project and we want to run it as an, as an open source project, but this raises some questions. For example, when we want to add a new feature, it's always a question, uh, is this feature Google specific, for example? Is this feature something that will only be useful for large deployments? Or is it something that is generic? And um, not, on, not only on the feature side, but for example, um, how do we deal with designing an IT? Do we keep it a purely internal uh, issue and do we do a, a closed design process and then just make releases externally? Or do we actually have an open source design process? And if so, how do we deal with things that are Google specific or for example, uh, depend on the kind of hardware that you run Ganeti on inside Google or networking and so on. Um, so what we've tried is uh, to make sure that um, if you run a single Ganeti cluster and you don't um, need a lot of automation, then you get the same features as you have in Google. So by installing uh, Ganeti from uh, Debian, you get exactly the same Ganeti as you run internally on a single cluster, let's say. Um, where we have internal components then is um, when we tie into the Google specific features like integration with machine management, integration with monitoring, integration with uh, repairs workflow and, workflow and so on. Now it would be nice if we could open all this but they are mostly uh, co corporation specific or deployment specific. Um, here we have um, we have done other presentations and you can find, uh, find slides onto the project website where we describe, while we cannot open source, at least we describe the, the software that we run together with Ganeti internally and the way we deploy it internally so that if you need to have a large deployment, you can duplicate it uh, also. Um, there are a couple of uh, open source alternatives to the, to the tools we use internally. Of course, there are monitoring solutions like Nagios and so on, and people uh, integrate that uh, very successfully with Ganeti. There are also some um, open source uh, web-based interfaces to Ganeti, um, which you can use today and, and they work. Another um, issue that, um, again, it's, it's a problem of scaling is that, as I said, originally we envisioned a, a small deployment of Ganeti inside Google. So Ganeti started simply as a command line tool uh, designed by sysadmins for sysadmins. So this can still be seen today in the fact that uh, Ganeti is mainly a command line uh, application, which might seem outdated uh, in today's world. Um, we realized this after a while that once we deployed more and more Ganeti, this was not the best way to actually automate uh, Ganeti, uh, interaction with Ganeti itself. Uh, so we started adding uh, an HTTP-based API. It's REST-based JSON encoding and so on, um, very standard to say so, 
And um, today we have um, parity, uh, full parity on the virtual machine operations, but not on the cluster management operations. So, for example, if you just want to create virtual machines, reboot them, resize them, um, reinstall them, and so on, you can do this via the HTTP-based API from whatever language you want. We also ha offer a higher level um, client uh, in Python. But if you need to do cluster management operations, like initializing the cluster in the first place, adding more physical machine to the cluster, uh, doing some um, other not, not, not so usual uh, cluster operations, then you need to revert to the, to the command line API, uh, the command line uh, interface. So in, internally, we have tools that use both of them. And um, this is not an ideal situation, and we're trying long term to move to offer full, full parity between the two interfaces. But so far, we have this um, disconnect to say so. Now, um, something uh, uh, slightly more technical. Um, once we have dealt with the processes and how we think about Ganeti, how do we actually deploy Ganeti internally? Uh, we have uh, two main um, release modes that we do in Ganeti. Um, one is what we call a major release. Here we have a, a release cycle that is a bit longer than we'd like. Uh, we do usually six, around six months. And in the major release cycles is where we add um, major and backwards incompatible features. And because of this, uh, we, are, um, we do a very slow rollout, to say so, of the new Ghana team. We start with a beta release. We, this is the point um, that we first announce both internal teams and external, uh, on the external developer mailing list that uh, the features for the new uh, release are kind of frozen. Uh, please start testing. Um, your tools that interact with Ganeti and so on. And um, probably here we have a couple of weeks until people test um, and see what changes they need to, to update in their tools. And once uh, internally, once we have, um, or, uh, all teams have confirmed that um, compatibility with the new Ganeti API is, uh, is okay, we start a canary process. And we usually start on um, one or two Ganeti clusters and roll out incrementally uh, in a geometric fashion, two, four, eight, and so on clusters. Uh, by the time we reach about 60, 50% uh, of the fleet, uh, we, we, since we, ha we have a quite a large uh, deployment internally, we say, okay, the new version of Ganity looks good, and uh, we make the .0 release, to say so. So whenever we publish an external XY.0 release, then uh, you can know that it's been tested on the Google fleet, and it works well. After this, we start, um, we, we stop the incremental rollout and do a, a full-scale rollout on the internal fleet. Um, the problem uh, that we see with, um, big re with major releases is that being incompatible, it's harder to roll back from a, from a major release. So this is why we are very careful in making sure that we only roll out on a wide scale after we know that um, the, the likeliness of, uh, to need a rollback is very low. On the other hand, when we have a, a minor release, which takes us, uh, for example, from xy.z to xyz plus one, uh, we try to keep these releases uh, small. It's about a, a month of, um, between them, and um, they are fully backwards and uh, forwards compatible, so you can just install the new version of Ganeti. If something is broken for you, you can easily revert. Here, we don't have such a, um, a, a long canary process. We just do one or two, um, weeks of canary on a couple of clusters, and when that is done, we, we roll out very quickly to, to all the fleet. Um, from time to time, we do add some new features uh, in the new re uh, minor releases, but they are, again, backwards and forwards compatible, so it's not actually a problem to, to do this. Um, after the, discussing the, the de deployment model, I would like to, to discuss a bit about the development model. We run uh, not a very uh, complex development model. It's the usual write code, tests, and so on. Um, the difficulty or the, the challenge here is how do we integrate actually requests? Being an open source project that is used both externally and internally in, in an extensive way, um, the problem is how to prioritize requests both from, both from the internal teams. For example, we have requests from customers, um, they want uh, their VMs to behave slightly differently. For example, uh, we have a group internally that runs software load balancers on top of Ganeti, and they've seen that when live migrating uh, VMs, it can be that the, um, the delay during live migration is high enough that it disrupts the, the software load balancer operation. 
So they want uh, features like being able to mark VMs as never live migrate. It's better to do the uh, HA at the application level and it's fine to shut down the, the VM. Um, we also have internal requests from the operations team. Uh, how, for example, to make sure that um, Ganeti behaves better when you need to, uh, to emergency shut down a, a big cluster of Ganeti and you don't uh, care so much about the clean shutdown of all the VMs, but instead of making sure that you get the storage consistent in the shortest amount of time possible and so on, and the same when you bring it back up and so on. Um, besides this, we also have requests from external customers. And uh, the interesting part about uh, external people is that even though they might um, deploy Ganeti on the same scale as we do both uh, on, in small clusters and both in large clusters, it is different, uh, they, they run it in different modes. Um, so for example, when we initially de uh, developed Ganeti, as Google doesn't use shared storage, we simply offered support for uh, local attached storage. So uh, people uh, started asking, can you support at all shared storage? So yes, but it's not a priority for us, please and patches. And indeed, uh, we had some significant contributors, for example, uh, contributions, for example, from the Greek Research and Education Network. They are uh, our biggest external contributors. And they added shared storage support, and uh, you have a different number of options there. And they also added something that, um, as I mentioned, in, inside Google, we have machine databases and so on. And the machine database contains things as host names, uh, MAC addresses, IP addresses. So when we uh, developed Ganeti, uh, from our side, we don't need Ganeti to handle this. But other companies that, that run Ganeti, they don't have this level of integration, so people said, Maybe we should add things like network pool management in Ganeti so you can have um, single um, play solutions for all the, all the management uh, of uh, also networking, not only storage and, and virtualization. Um, so it's good when external requests come with patches. This is very good. Sometimes they don't come with patches. So it's always a question of how do you prior prioritize internal bugs, which are in the internal back tracker versus external bugs and so on. And it's not always easy to to manage the release cycles to, to satisfy both internal and external customers. And lastly, we have uh, features that we as the development team want to add to Ganeti. These are not short-term features. Usually we know that by this time next year, we would like Ganeti to have this and this feature uh, added or evolve in this, in this direction based on where we see the, the use inside of Google going or the industry uh, trends and so on. So it's always a balance. After um, selecting the feature, the usual write code uh, part starts. Um, we use Git for uh, version control, so this allows us to work um, both when working in the Google office or when traveling or on a plane, which is good. Um, we use uh, Python and Haskell um, for Ganeti um, due to a historical accident or so to say. Uh, most of the um, interaction with the machine is done in, in uh, Python, but there are some parts in Ganeti like uh, capacity calculation, cluster balancing, and so on, which is more of a mathematical model and maps better to Haskell. Uh, on top of that, we use a, a no standard GNU-based uh, build system, Autoconf, Automake, and so on, and um, we use RST, restructure text for documentation, so these are all very standard tools. And in general, all our build system and um, developer system is based on open source software, so external people can replicate our entire setup if they want. Um, once this is done, um, we run tests locally, of course. Um, the test system is, again, very standard. In Python, it's based on uh, the standard unit test library. In Haskell, it's based on QuickCheck. Uh, we also have used shell test, which is an open source tool for uh, testing uh, command line tools. And um, after developers run tests locally, um, we move to BuildBot Try. BuildBot, you might be aware of it, is an open source uh, continuous test environment. Um, we use it very successfully internally, and uh, the use of BuildBot ensures that any test that uh, developers run locally are also run in a certain pristine environment, so that we don't have variations due to, to laptops or desktops with various Python libraries and so on. And um, unit tests only solve part of the problem. Uh, for the other part of the problem, which is testing how actually Ganeti works with the, on the real machines, we have um, a QA environment. But because of the um, QA environment, a, a whole QA run takes a lot. We usually do this in parallel with the review process. Uh, so what does the QA environment do? Is um, go um, upload the, the version of Ganeti that we want to test um, on actual physical machines, initialize a cluster, add all the physical machines to the cluster and run through 
almost all the, the operations of the cluster that you can do. Um, however, uh, the downside of the QA environment is that um, Ganetti is quite complex. It supports um, six storage backends, um, two and soon three um, network backends. It supports three virtualization solutions. So it's uh, not feasible, feasible to test all of these combinations. On top of that, uh, KVM, which is the most complex backend, um, for example, has over 40 parameters. And there are some bugs which uh, manifest only in certain corner cases. A recent example is, for example, that if you take a um, KVM uh, instance and you run it with VNC uh, front end and with a custom key map and you live migrate it, this triggered a bug in Ganetti, but only in this configuration. So uh, while we do test the actual configurations we deploy Ganetti internally, we cannot test uh, all the possible configurations of, on, of Ganetti. And here we rely on uh, external people to actually test setups that we don't run and, and maybe don't think necessarily of and, and see how it works for them. So while the QA runs, which takes usually between one and three hours depending on the configuration, uh, we do the, the code review process. As you might know, inside of Google, all code goes through a review process, and we do keep the same model for Ganetti, even though it's an open source model. And here again, we use the standard open source tools. It's Git format patch, Git send email, and a, and a mailing list based um, review process. And in the, in the review process, we care about things like, of course, code quality and so on, but also um, style uh, compliance. We try to have a consistent style across all of Ganetti code base so that um, new developers can easily come and, and touch all parts of the code base and so on. Um, and once the um, review process is done and um, actually hopefully the, the QA uh, process uh, has passed successfully, we um, commit the code and then we push it to the upstream repository. And uh, again, uh, the repository is um, fully visible. We don't have an internal repository, and we actually, all the commits go to the external Git repository, and you can follow up the, the development there. And also the, um, the design process that I mentioned also is, uh, the design documents are also inside the Ganetti source tree, so you can watch the design process going exactly through the same thing. Well, except not, no unit test for design, but again, review discussion on the mailing list and so on. Once the code is pushed to the, to the tree, BuildBot again will go and rerun now the officially committed code, unit tests, a, QA, a longer QA this time. And once that is done and uh, all the BuildBot tests are uh, green, then basically we are done with the feature and people go look at the back queue again, internal, external, and um, start working on a new feature. And with that, um, thank you. I pass it back to Jeff. <laughs> So uh, I know we've uh, got a few minutes left here. Uh, hopefully this has been useful. This is, uh, the, these are the lessons that we've learned as Google has grown and uh, you know, the various tools that we've used and uh, you know, how we've moved things forward. So uh, given the last few minutes we have left, if there are any uh, questions, I'd uh, be love to take some. But uh, thank you all for coming and I hope, uh, it's, uh, hope you've had a, a great day here. I was wondering if you could say a few words about how you manage developer laptops, especially with regards to building them before and upgrading or repairing after damages. That's, uh, so when you're talking about damages, are you referring to the physical damage of the machines? Uh, anything that would re require a replacement of the hard drive in particular, I guess, uh, if the developer's data has to be Ah. Migrated or Bob, do you want to? Uh, yeah. <laughs> since you get it, since you get to deal with that often. So I'm Robert. Uh, I, I did a, another presentation earlier this week about how we do internal support. So your question was, uh, how do you deal with developer laptops? Uh, we actually have some policies in place uh, where you're not actually supposed to store code on laptops, but typically when you're talking about hard drives, um, they're encrypted, so we do a data transfer um, to a new hard, hard drive and replace it uh, in the laptop. Or if it's, you know, it's gonna take a long time, it'll be a new, a new laptop with a, 
a similar build, a similar build laptop, um, but a new, a new laptop and uh, essentially copy over the critical stuff if we can, uh, essentially rebuild it for the user and get them on their way. Does that answer your question? I was interested in how you establish the base images, I guess, uh, for when, what the fresh laptop install looks like. Oh, so like the images we use to, uh, to give out to like just anybody? Yeah. Um, yeah, we can talk a little bit about that. We, we have basically standard images for, for each model of, uh, or each OS, right? So Windows, Mac, and Linux. Uh, and then uh, from that standard, standard model, uh, there's typically recommended packages that you can install for developers or for someone working in legal or for someone you know, working in, in business applications. Uh, and that's basically a vanilla image and then the user basically determines what they need uh, with a recommended list usually. And that's usually set up within the, the first day or second day that they're working, so. Does that answer your, your question? Yeah, I guess so. All right. And if I just might add something here, um, what we try to do is um, make sure that most of the developer builds and so on are not done on the actual laptop. So you use the laptop for a regular machine, but as I said, we use uh, extensively internally virtual desktops. So people get the laptop, but the laptop is mostly used to connect to a virtual machine which runs in the data center, and there you have all your desktop environment, build environment, and so on. So this mitigates to a certain degree uh, the replacement of the laptop and so on. I mean, one of, one of the other benefits of moving, you know, I was talking about moving to the cloud earlier, is like we use docs for almost everything, which means that you know, for anything that has been written, you know, whether I'm using my Chromebook or whether I'm using you know, my MacBook or whatever else it might be, I've got it then there and available. And we try to you know, apply that as broadly as we possibly can in terms of uh, you know, all, all types of information as well. So I know you guys write a lot of code, um, and I'm just curious how similar or different your SDLC and your, your tools and processes look compared to the product engineering teams. Hey, do you use the same practices and standards? We, I, I mean, as closely as we possibly can. Uh, we try to follow the same practices and procedures. Um, there's a little bit of variance in terms of some of the, you know, some of the tools that, that we build, for instance, you know, like, uh, let's see, a good example is like how, how you have to do compliance sometimes and things like that. Um, you have, uh, shall we say, non-technical external forces which will shape how you, you know, how you have to keep data and how it has to be made available and all of that. Uh, and so in that case, we will have to do something that is a little bit different. But you know, by and large, we, you know, we, we try to run exactly the same way as the, you know, the, the prod environment does as well, and keeping with the same practices. So you know, the same code reviews that go through, making sure that you know, the, the, all the engineers who are looking at it are, you know, that, that they're working in the right language and that they're following the same policies and procedures. And actually, in fact, you know, we, we end up with, there will be people who work within corporate engineering who have come from the, you know, the production environment and vice versa. You know, that's one of the things that we do a lot of within, uh, within Google is encouraging people to work within different areas. And so there's this uh, circle of life. Well, that, that would imply that people are you know, dying, so we try to avoid that part. But, I mean, other than that, I mean, it is something where we try to keep that circle inside of there so that you get the information that people have learned from working on the production side that they can apply within you know, the internal environment and vice versa as well. So, you know, uh, barring external forces or you know, another need set that's associated with it, we very much try to, try to follow the same thing. It's a little bit different when you start to talk about if we are integrating some, you know, something that we've bought, for instance, um, because that's, you know, that's just kind of a different development model at that point when you're, you know, using something that is, you know, quote unquote off the shelf. But, you know, when it comes to all the things that we build, we try to, you know, adhere to the same things. Um, I think one of the, uh, you know, but one of the, one of the things that we really try to do that, that may be a bit different is developing, developing as much as we can on top of the cloud platform. Um, because it just makes life way, way easier for us. 
and we are dealing, you know, we've got a different scale that we're working with at that point. So sure. that is a difference as well. Thanks. Yeah. yeah and as an enterprise IT guy, I mm -hmm. appreciate when you rub off on the product team <laughs> as far as compliance and yeah. as external forces. Yes, the, the expression they get sometimes when you have to explain things is slightly priceless as well. You have to do what for what? You don't even want to know why. <laughs> okay, um, may I ask, uh, it wasn't completely apparent to me, uh, all this infrastructure and the tooling you mentioned, like for instance, Ganeti, is that what's uh, backing up uh, product development or is it also what's behind uh, the external products like Gmail and... Uh, no, private. so, so um, as you mentioned, this is only corporate IT. So for example, Ganeti is used for the internal system, as I mentioned, DNS servers, caches, and so on, but not for the prod network. Um, those are very different in that sense, and it's, we use Ganeti for the non-cloud part, and okay. all those are cloud products in that okay. sense. Okay, uh, and I would like to ask two specific questions. Uh, what sort of uh, visualization technology does Ganeti Uses. So uh, Ganeti supports Zen and KVM as production okay. level hypervisors. We also have LXC as an experimental mode. Um, please try and, and report back. Okay, and uh, the last one is, um, I would like to ask you a comment about how do you handle uh, diversity in the, um, because you obviously have a, a large fleet of machines. How do you handle diversity on operating systems? I mean, uh, running different versions no. or st stuff like that. So um, the way Ganeti itself deals with operating system is that you simply have to give a, a operating system image definition. Um, the, it's a very simple API. You have to provide five scripts, one for creating okay. operating systems, one for renaming them and so on, import, export, and so on. Uh, internally, we don't run very varied uh, operating systems okay. because um, so we run very standard Linux and so on. The, Parts that we cannot virtualize are the ones that are not certified to run, to run under virtualization okay. and so on. So we, while so Ganeti supports uh, multiple operating systems on, we don't uh, have a very uh, heterogeneous fleet. And this is again a, different, a difference from external deployments where the, usually you have heterogeneous environments. Okay. So you do try to minimize diversity in your, in your fleet? As much as possible, yes. Okay. We have exceptions, of course, and if it, yeah. if it needs to be an exception, of course, we allow it. But, um, we try to, to keep it homogeneous because it, it's easier to manage yeah, that. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you all for uh, coming out. I think we, well, we are 30 seconds away from the end of our time, so uh, have a wonderful evening, and uh, thank you for coming.